later. Okay, Michael said and held the heavy box tighter and walked slowly back down the hall to the small bedroom that used to be his. He opened the door and went in, put the penny box down on the floor and sat down staring at his aunt. She wasn't singing, just sitting. John boy, she said. Yes, Aunt Do, Michael answered and didn't care this time that she was calling him John again. He was trying to think. Put my music on. The music wasn't going to help him be think because the first thing she was going to do was make him move to the music too. But Michael got off the hundred penny box and then reached down under his bed and pulled out the blue record player that he had got for his birthday. He had already plugged it in the wall and when he heard her say, Get mine, my, my own Victrola, the, the one your father gave me. Mama threw it out, Michael said, and knew he had told her already, lots of times. It was broken. Aunt Du squeezed her lips really tight together. Your mama's going to throw me out soon, she said. Michael stood still and stared at his great aunt. Mama can't throw people out, she said. Put my music on, boy, Aunt Du said, and, and be quick about it. Okay, Michael said, and he turned the record player on and got the record, Aunt Du's favorite, that they had saved and hidden in the bottom drawer. The dusty chipped record was of a lady singing that long song, Precious Lord, take my hand. Michael turned it down low. Aunt Du started humming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Michael sat down on the bed and tried to think about what he'd do with the hundred penny box. What would you do with that box? I don't know. What, what should Michael do? Aunt Du got up from her rocking chair and stood up. She kept her arms down by her sides and made her thin hands into fists and then clenched her lips tight and moved really slow in one spot. Her small shoulders just went up and down and up and down. Get up, John boy, she said, and move with me. Move with Dubet Thomas. Did I have enough time in there? Michael's still thinking about this box. Mom says she's going to take it. I, I don't feel like dancing, Michael said, and he kept sitting on the bed. But he watched his great, great aunt do move both her thin arms to one side and then to the other and then move her hands about and hold the dress. Then she stopped, then she started all of a sudden again, just swinging her arms and moving her shoulders up and down and singing some more. Every time the record ended, he'd start it again. When he was playing it for the third time, he said, Aunt Du, where will you put your hundred pennies if you lose your hundred penny box? When I lose my hundred penny box, I lose me, she said, and kept moving herself from side to side and humming. I mean, maybe you need something better than an old, cracked-up, wacky-dacky box with a top broken. It's my old, cracked-up, wacky-dacky box with a top broken, Aunt Du said, and Michael saw her move her shoulders really high that time. Them's my years in that box, she said. That's me in that box. Can I hide the hundred-penny box, Aunt Du? Michael asked, hoping that she'd say yes and not ask him why. He'd hide it like the other stuff she'd ask him to hide. No, don't hide my hundred penny box, Aunt Du said out loud. Leave my hundred penny box right alone. Anybody take my hundred penny box takes me. Just in case, Michael said impatiently and, and wished his great great aunt would sit back down in her chair so he could talk to her. Just in case Mama puts it in the furnace when you go to sleep like she puts all your stuff in the furnace in the basement. What's your mama's name? Oh, no, Michael said. You keep on forgetting mama's name. That was the only thing bad about being a hundred years old like Aunt Do. You kept on forgetting things that were important. I do that now, and I'm only, I'm only 60. Hush, John boy, Aunt Do said, and stopped dancing and humming and sat back down in the chair and put the quilt back over her legs. You keep on forgetting. I don't. You do. You keep on forgetting. Do I forget to play with you when you worry me to death so to play? Michael didn't answer. Do I forget to play when you want to play? No. Okay, what's your mama's name? Who's that in my kitchen? <sighs> mama's name's Ruth. 
But this isn't your house. Your house is in Atlanta. We went to get you and now you live with us. Ruth? Michael saw Aunt Deuce staring at him again. Whenever she stared at him like that, he never knew what she'd say next. Sometimes it had nothing to do with what they had just been talking about. You John's baby, he said, still staring at him. Look like, look like John just spit you out. That's my father. My great nephew, Aunt Du said, only one ever cared about me. Aunt Du rocked hard in her chair, and then Michael watched her. He got off the bed and turned off the record player and put the record back into the bottom drawer. Then he sat down in the hundred penny box again. See that tree out there? Aunt Du said, pointing to her finger straight at straight toward that window, with the uh, with the large. Uh, here's that tree in the window here. Large tree pressed up against it. Michael knew exactly what she'd say. Didn't have no puny looking trees like that near my house, she said. Do bed Thomas, that's me, and, and Henry Thomas, that was my late husband. He had the biggest, tallest trees and prettiest trees and the widest yard in all Atlanta. And John, that was your daddy, liked it because he was city and my five sons, Henry Jr. and Truck and Late and, and the twins, Booker and Jay, well, it didn't make them no never mind because it was always there. But when my oldest niece, Junie, and her husband, we called him Big John, uh, brought your daddy down to visit every summer, they couldn't get the suitcase in the house good before he was climbing up and falling out of the tree. We'd almost had to feed him up in them trees. Aunt Du, we have to hide the box. Junie and Big John went out in the water. I was feeling funny all day. Didn't know what it was. Just, just feeling funny. I, I told Big John, I said, Big John, that boat is nothing but a piece of junk. But he fooled around and said, we're taking it out. I looked and I saw him and Junie in the water and, and it wasn't nothing. Both gone. And the boat turned over, going downstream. Your daddy brand new little britches on, just staring there, looking, and wasn't saying nothing, no hollering. I tried to give him a big hunk of potato pie, but, but he was just looking at me and just looking and standing. Wouldn't eat nothing of that pie. Then I said, run get Harry Thomas and the boys. He looked at me, and when he looked at the water, he turned around real slow and walked toward the west field. He never run. All you could see was him in them stiff little britches, red as he was, uh, moving along through the corn. Bare-waisted he was. When, when I found the boat later, he took it clean apart, what was left of it, every plank and pushed it back in the water. Uh, I watched him. Wasn't a piece left of that boat, not a splinter. Aunt Du, where can we hide the box? What box? The hundred penny box. We can't hide the hundred penny box. And, and if she got to take my hundred penny box, then she might as well take me. Well, well, we have to hide it. No, we don't. It's my box. Michael was beginning to feel desperate, but he couldn't tell her what his mother had said. Suppose Mama takes it when you go to sleep. Aunt Du stopped rocking and stared at him again. Like John just beat you out. She said, Now go on, count them pennies, boy. Uh, unless you worry me in the grave if you don't. Do bet Thomas a hundred penny box. Do bet Thomas a hundred years old and I got a penny to prove it each year. Michael got off the hundred penny box and sat down on the floor by his great uh, aunt's skinny feet stuck down inside his father's old slippers. He pulled the big wooden box toward him and lifted the lid and reached in and took out the small cloth rose print sack that filled with pennies. He dumped the pennies out into the box. He was about to pick up one penny and put it in the sack the way they played and said, One, when his great great aunt spoke. Why do you want to hide my hundred penny box? To play, Michael said after he thought for a moment. Well, play now, she said. Don't hide my hundred penny box. I got to keep looking at my box, and, and when I don't see my box, I won't see me either. One, Michael had said, dropped the penny back into the old print sack. 1874. Hmm, Aunt Du said, yeah, I was born. Slavery over. Black men in Congress running things, and, and they was in charge. Uh, it was a reconstruction. 
Michael counted 27 pennies back into the old print sack before she stopped talking about reconstruction. Hmm, 19, 19 and all one. Aunt Dew said, I, I was 27 years old. Birthed my two twins. Hattie said, uh, do bet you got two babies. I asked Henry Thomas. I said, Henry Thomas, what them boys look like? By the time Michael had counted 56 pennies, his mother was standing at the door. Hmm, 1930, uh, Aunt Dew said, depression. Henry Thomas, that was my late husband, died. Uh, died after he was put in the 56 penny in my box. He had the double pneumonia and no decent shoes and he was working too hard. Said he was going to sweat the trouble out of his lungs. Couldn't do it. Same year I sold that fancy dress for Raina Coles. She wanted 100 bows all over that dress. I was sewing bows and tying bows and twisting bows and cursing all the time. Was her fourth wedding husband. Fourth husband. And she wanted a dress full of bow ribbons. Henry, the one started the, started the box, you know. Put the first, oh, here they are. Again, he's counting the pennies. Henry was the first to put 31 pennies in it for me, and then it was my birthday. After 56, I put them all in myself. Aunt Dew, time to go to bed, his mother said, standing at the door. Now, I'm not sleepy, Aunt Dew said. John Boy and I just talking. Why you don't call him John? Look like John just spit him out. Why you got to call that boy something different than his daddy? Michael watched his mother and walked over and opened the window wide. We'll get some fresh air in here, she said. And, and then, that too, you can take your nap and better, feel better and, and feel good when you wake up. Michael wouldn't let his mother take the sack of pennies out of his hand. He held it tight and, he let, and then she let go. I, I'm not sleepy, Aunt Dew said again. This child and me just talking. I know, his mother said, pointing a finger at him a little, but we're just going to take your nap anyway. Well, I got a long time to sleep. I ain't ready now. Just leave me alone and, and let me sit here in this narrow piece of room. I'm not bothering nobody. Nobody said you're bothering anyone, but as soon as I start making that meatloaf, you're going to go to sleep in your chair and fall out again and then hurt yourself. And John will wonder where I was and say, I was on the telephone, and that would be something all over again. Michael, his mother said, and took the sack of pennies out of his hand and laid it on the dresser. Then she reached down and closed the lid of the hundred penny box.